years now uh, that I was banned from the world's largest democracy, uh, deported, and uh, subsequently have not been allowed back into India because I'm on some kind of blacklist. And which speaks, I think, to the um, topic here of against, against the grain, because uh, dissent is under attack uh, all over the world, particularly in the world's largest democracy, where uh, activists from Greenpeace and Amnesty International, uh, photographers from National Geographic, a geologist from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and others have been in various shapes and forms uh, limited in what they can do in India. Many of them have been uh, deported and put on uh, blacklists, which I think speaks to narratives that states create for themselves. And we have our own narrative here about a brave and um, entrepreneurial pioneers who settled the Wild West and uh, America's role in the world today is to uh, deliver democracy to the unwashed masses. Uh, reality suggests something quite different, as uh, George Orwell said in the unpublished uh, preface to Animal Farm. It's, it is available in the Ukrainian edition, by the way. Uh, which has been translated, thankfully, into, into English. He always, he said in this uh, unpublished uh, version introduction that at any particular time, there is a certain amount of, there's bounds of limited, of permissible thought. There are certain things that you can talk about and other things, as Orwell said, that just wouldn't do. So massacres of indigenous populations, enslavement, um, imperialism, wars, occupations, it just wouldn't do to talk about uh, those things. So on that note, I'm going to just see, ask the panelists to chime in with their thoughts on um, against the grain, what it's like swimming upriver. I think it's always more interesting going against the current. You meet a lot of interesting people <laughs> ra rather than flowing with the flotsam and jetsam downstream. You, it builds, builds, it's really exciting too. So if you have any uh, thoughts and comments and then we'll turn it over to the audience for the last 10 minutes. Ladies, don't go first. <laughs> Use your microphone. Microphone. Um, ladies and women need not go first. So I will not necessarily begin. I will offer. <laughs> offer one of my fellow panelists the opportunity to begin, and then I will join you. In times of group speak, leaks, speak fear, speak alternatives, dissidents listed, black for speaking out against white supremacy, for humanity, for truth, for love, against machines, against rage, against peace in the face of rage, currents. It's as far as I got, that's my introduction. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, artistically, I'm known as uh, Molina Speaks. I was walking through the library uh, with my wife and child, and uh, the first thing I experienced was uh, somebody um, I don't know, I don't know what she was doing. Mocking me, uh, ridiculing me for, <laughs> for walking next to uh, my wife who's pushing uh, the stroller of our five month old. And she mumbles something about, oh, I probably can't understand her anyway. People like me probably don't know what she's saying. Uh, maybe assuming I don't speak English. And the only one of the three of us who doesn't speak English uh, is Baby Seed, because she only speaks the universe. She's five months old. But, you know, you come to an international literary festival, and that's one of the first things you hear. I didn't plan to speak on that, but that's what happened. And those kind of things happen on a regular basis, you know. And uh, what do we do about them? What do we say about them? A lot of times, we don't say anything at all. We're trained to be silent. We're trained to watch injustices happen right before our eyes every single day. Um, the fact that we ignore and avoid uh, microaggressions we ignore and avoid racism and sexism and classism and discrimination. We avoid and ignore uh, disrespect of humanity in very small instances in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so it's no wonder that we can ignore these things on a mass scale. 
Uh, we ignore genocides. We ignore uh, injustices of mass proportion. We ignore modern day slavery. We ignore these things, and I think it's easy to ignore these things because on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we don't speak out about the small things that happen to us or the small things that we observe. We become okay with looking at homeless people on the side of the road asking for money and make excuses about why they're doing that and assume that it's not a real problem when it is. Um, when you choose to speak out, when you choose to uh, write, to create, to present, to put out music, to put out poetry that goes against the grain, uh, it creates problems for you. You know, it creates problems first and foremost uh, with your family, with your friends, with people you grow up with. Uh, you become strange. You become, um, you know, an outcast, even within your, own, uh, within your own families, right? Within your own communities. And uh, it's a day-to-day -day struggle, you know? And, and you find grounding in, in the fact that uh, you're, you're one of these small little particles dancing in space. You know, on this spaceship called Earth that revolves around the sun, you're just a small little thing. There was a lot that came before you. There was much that will come after you. You're just a little particle in space. So you, you have to become uh, kind of centered in that and find humor and comedy and satire in uh, the ridiculousness of the state of humanity, you know, as it exists right now. Uh, you have to be able to laugh at injustice and uh, you have to keep pushing like those salmon that run upstream on their runs against the grains to uh, produce that next layer of life, that next generation of seeds that will keep pushing and keep humanity moving forward in some kind of a way that the heavens, the gods, uh, the colors in space could look at us and be proud of. Because uh, humanity's uh, not doing so great right now. But um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's lovely to be here. Thank you all. Well, I was very taken this morning by Namita's uh, invocation of the secret life of words. And I'm going to join that to the secret or the suppressed life of historical and cultural and political, because they all start joining, narratives uh, that America is so, is so deft. Uh, at suppressing, repressing, disguising. Uh, when I was growing up, of course, the dominant cultural, historical, political narratives were um, European. That was even superior to white American. But of course, if you were white American, it was easier to sort of pass as a proto-European. Um, and so you got um, these other languages, vernaculars, traditions, in all kinds of ways. You got them orally, but you also got them in written, written accounts that weren't yet, that were fugitive, written fugitive accounts. For example, a, a now dated sounding organization like the um, Association for you know, the Study of Negro Life and History. This existed apart from um, segregated from you know, the, the dominant, the white representative historical associations. You know, now we talk, for example, about you know, all the books about Reconstruction and the Civil War. Some of the first daring, bold, pioneering work about that was done by these historians no one was paying attention to except you know, their own people. There were you know, when I think of all the narratives, um, Latino, Asian American, um, South Asian, that simply did not exist. Um, it's overwhelming. And I don't want to be pious about that because um, I realize as I'm talking that, you know, I'm presenting the black-white narrative. And it's my job to continue as an American to incorporate these other um, 
national and immigrant and cultural narratives into my, my practice, uh, my practice as a writer, as a thinker. Uh, you know, you're constantly in this, in this process of, of changing yourself, expanding yourself. There's always damage. Um, you know, it, we say, or we used to say in the 60s, oh, you know, you've been brainwashed. Um, and that's, that's one mark of the damage. Um, but it's also the, um, it's the shame uh, that anyone who is associated with suppressed or despised or patronized. Um, you know, mockery can be as harmful you know, as, as open cruelty. It's the shame that was inculcated in you at an early age that you must find ways, um, intelligent ways, uh, to not only defensive ways, um, intelligent ways to counter, to air, um, to make part of your politics to acknowledge, you know, to bring your imagination and your, and your psyche to, to bear on. Um, so it's a, it's a continual internal as well as external education. Um, the not forgetting, the not overlooking, the not becoming pious. Um, every new, every generation, every pol political um, change brings new kinds of groupspeak, and that's the tricky thing. Um, you know, even you know, we were all so excited, for example, about the the cultural and political and social shifts that just Obama becoming president meant. But there are new kinds of groupspeak now. You know, leaving. I'm not even addressing um, changes, um, choices he's made that that I and that many people here disapprove of. But you know, every, every shift brings new kinds of conventions, of pieties. You know, and chances are, if your group is on the ascent, one part of you is very happy to settle into those pieties um, and kind of benefit. Those are, that's, the, that's the treachery of power. And it's no less when you can say, well, I've been you know, I've been despised, I've been scorned, I've been put upon. I have the right, you know, to kind of bask in my new power now. Um, so, um, on that glowing and um, <laughs> positive note, um, I, will, I, will, I will move on. Um, but, yeah, group speak wears many masks and has many disguises and many kinds of language. You know, so, you know, in this mono linguistic, cultural um, landscape that America is always reverting to, um, you know, we, we have to be, um, you know, um, poly, poly, <laughs> poly, multilingual, um, you know, oral, written, all of that. Oh, you've got yours. Okay. No, I think, just building off of what Margot was saying, you know, this is a pretty fascinating and in some ways a worrying time uh, for group speak, mainly because of 24-hour news and the internet and the ways that uh, information as well as disinformation can just be multiplied. You know, uh, Margo, you said something earlier, and, and forgive me, I, I, don't, I don't think I have the word quite right, but that it's your duty as an American writer to talk about all these different forms of, of American life? I don't know if I said duty, but I said it's, an, it's a necessity. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a form of ignorance and hypocrisy not to constantly you know, be acknowledging what you were ignorant of and what wasn't on your landscape that you may not be the central character in. Yes, <laughs> okay. uh, absolutely. Oh, that's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not starring. <laughs> And, and when you said that, I really connected to it, and, and especially the, the ways that we talk about the black and white narrative, because my new book is about the 1992 LA riots. And I mean, as far as famous <laughs> historical black and white narratives in American life, that's a big one. As I started doing my research, I spent a lot of time with former Latino gang members, firefighters, 
highway patrol officers, nurses, a lot of these voices that were not heard during that time, that were not explored, you know, and, and one of the things that I find as I'm kind of doing wonderful panels like this is I have to explain to people, you know, Los Angeles is one of the most diverse cities on earth. Over 90 languages spoken, an ethnic community from almost every nation on earth. And what I was interested in, and I think this kind of sticks with going against the grain, was just those voices that, that weren't being heard, those experiences that you know, uh, were being ignored in service to this kind of overarching narrative that made it simple and easy. Uh, so in a way, I think it started with a statistic, um, simply that 60 people died during the six days of the Los Angeles riots. But when I compared that to the other numbers, over 11,000 fires, over 8,000 arrests, over 2,000 wounded people, and then I looked at the amount of homicides in Los Angeles in 1992, over 3,000. Just to put that in perspective, because that's, that's crazy. That's almost 10 a day. Uh, the, the cocaine wars in Miami, which seem to be with narcos and all of these things, it's, it's very much talked about. Over four years, 3,000 people died in Miami. In 92, 3,000 died in LA, and yet we don't talk about it. Mainly because it was people of color or gang members. You know, that's not part of the narrative. So a as I went into some of these communities, and in many places I was told, oh, you, you, you shouldn't go there, you're not allowed to go there. There, I think there's, Los Angeles is a really interesting place, mainly because I think there are so many different cities within it. This is completely true uh, in that there's a Pasadena, there's a Santa Monica, there's a Malibu, it's literally true, but I think there are also uh, diameters that people have, you know, radiuses that they go in and they don't visit anywhere else. So it was, you know, being part of a street art crew in Los Angeles, um, and going to really some of the most hard-bitten places and putting art on the wall and helping to change the perception of some of these communities, being able to talk to the people there completely changed my understanding of, of what Los Angeles was like in the 90s or because I'd gotten that from television. So all I tried to do, and I think, you know, I, I could not possibly agree more, is as an American writer, you know, go with that necessity of, of trying to show the world a broader story of who we are. Well, certainly since, sorry, uh, Ryan. Well, certainly since Ferguson, Missouri, a, a year ago, uh, there has been an explosion of Rodney King type incidents of state security violence against unarmed, mostly African-American uh, men, people being choked to death in uh, Staten Island, uh, and on and on. One of the things that is really interesting about the time we live in is that there are a lot of counter-narratives being written. For example, uh, Eduardo Galeano, the great Uruguayan writer, wrote a history of Latin America called The Open Veins of Latin America, looking at history not from the perspective of conquistadors and the great men and kings and princes, but from the bottom. And that was picked up by Howard Zinn in his A People's History of the United States. Ali Mazrui wrote about it for African history. Uh, Juan Gonzalez about Latinos in the United States. So we do live in this kind of um, a contradiction where there's more and more media concentration, more and more groupthink, but there's also more and more counter-narratives as uh, different venues open up. Yeah, there are more opportunities. Uh, things like Twitter, things like Vine, YouTube, you know, there are all these new opportunities to broadcast different voices and actually, I know I mentioned earlier that the internet helps create this echo chamber for group speak, but it also creates uh, opportunities for, for dissent, and, and that's actually a beautiful thing. Um, I want to go back in terms of counter-narratives to something Mike, you please. said. I want to go back to something that you said about how you know, choices you make can make you alien in your own community, family, etc. 
the narratives can become very fixed. You know, there are, there are proper um, counter narratives and you, you know, you know what I mean. And those can become very, very fixed and simplistic, oversimplified. Um, there's a kind of, um, you know, there, there can be a very honorable version of your history that excludes you know, um, dishon mistakes, that, or there can be, for example, in the, um, I'm har sorry, harking back to the 60s, um, you know, there were certain, once there was this fabulous explosion of, you know, civil rights, then black power, I'll stick, on, stick to that, you know, the things that had been excluded from the respectability civil rights narrative um, were embraced by the black power narrative, but many things got excluded by that. Um, for example, the history of women, um, of black women, but, you know, uh, feminism was around the corner, you know, that wasn't permitted. So how did, how do class, race, um, gender histories, and that's, that was just broad categories within that, within gender, what are the class you know, and race histories? And what's, what's popular, what's fashionable is often a new form, very exciting and glittering, but um, exclusion, and it's very hard to go against the grain of the group that has been your bulwark, you know, and that it, it's easy to feel, I have no safety in the world without this group. So, you know, that's, that's just an interesting and treacherous business. Yeah. On that note, um, and, and tying in uh, social media and the internet and how all of this ties into group speak, I'm very thankful for technology, extremely thankful. I've released 16 independent albums, all DIY, all self-produced. Um, I never wanted to wait around for a record label or an A&R or some publishing company to legitimate me, something I'm very proud of. Um, if it wasn't for technology, if it wasn't for Facebook and Twitter and all these things, I wouldn't be able to get my work out the way that I do. I wouldn't have the gigs that I have and the opportunities to connect with human beings face to face in live performance and reading settings. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, at the same time, when I really step back and look at the forums that uh, Twitter and Facebook and a lot of these social media platforms provide, uh, there's still a profound sense of, of groupthink and follow the leader, even among you know, activist communities and so-called radicals. Everybody's just really kind of playing their role and you know, it may be a role that they saw on TV or in a movie or something that's become codified in a particular subculture or you know, um, following a, a particular hashtag or whatever it may be, but people slide into those roles very, very easily. And if you step outside of those roles, even if you're part of a counterculture, say the hip hop movement or the Chicano movement or the black power movement, or you know, you're part of a, an anarchist community or whatever, like you step out even just a little bit over this way, you know, or a little bit over here and people look at you and, um, wonder if you're the enemy. You know, people are, are so quick to wonder that if you're thinking outside of the box, even if it's the box outside the box, uh, people, get, people get scared of that. You know, people get really frightened by it. One, uh, you, might be, you might be a traitor or you're just too weird. One example I have is um, in 2010, late in 2010, I worked on this project called Build 2020 Manifesto a people's history of the future. I spent a lot of time in 2010 looking at government reports, projections of the future, think tanks, studying technocrats, uh, studying conspiracy theory, just trying to kind of piece together my own sense of like 10 years down the road, what does the world look like? What does um, technological society on a global scale look like and feel like? And what would it mean to build 2020 in an alternative, a truly alternative fashion. And um, at this time I was like making a lot of noise with my music in the independent hip hop community and getting a lot of like, you know, respect from uh, Denver Post, Reverb, 
uh, Westward, uh, from the Denver Post writers, from different people. And then I dropped this project, Build 2020, which it wasn't a hip hop album. It wasn't spoken word. It was like a uh, book on tape cut to hip hop and glitch beats. And it was like Howard Zinn meets like Immortal Technique and Yassine Bey, most deaf. You know, and, and, and that's kind of where I was coming from. And, and it was like, people like, is it, is it rap? Is it spoken word? It's neither of those things. And it's weird. This dude is talking about like cyborgs. He's talking about microchipping. He's talking about, um, you, you know, robots and singularity. Like what is singularity? Like at this point, what I put out in 2010 is like, it's everyday knowledge for, you know, the majority of people who know anything about kind of what's, what's really happening and the direction society is moving. You know, you go to a movie at, you know, Cinemax Theater or, you know, Metromax or whatever the, you know, whatever the main major, you know, movie theater companies are called these days. And, um, you know, you see like narrative after narrative, even in children's movies, you know, cartoons, which are teaching us uh, robots are going to take over the future. Transhumanism is normal. Um, we are one with machines. Uh, the future is not about trees and clouds and healthy water and, you know, soil that you can grow food in. It's just about us becoming one with our computers. And that's what we're inundated with over and over again. So anyhow, like what I put out now, it's, it's not that shocking. You listen to it and you're like, oh, all right, this is a nice little like summary of everything we see happening in society when it comes to technology, sustainability, humanity, cool. Five years ago, it was a little bit too out there. It was a little bit too far in the box within the box, outside the box, over there. And it, it cost me uh, some opportunities. It cost me some money-making opportunities, cost me some connections, uh, cost me some of the, the momentum I had going as an artist. And this wasn't among conservative people who were trying to brand me as some kind of strange outcast. This, this was amongst other artists, other intellectuals, other, you know, liberal, radical thinkers who just thought it was a little bit too weird. It happens. Against the grain, I mean, right now, you know, as we're sitting here in the relative comfort of this auditorium, uh, there's a huge humanitarian crisis going on uh, in the Middle East and in Southern Europe. People in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, are walking to new destinations, to new hopes, to new lives. Uh, very little is connected as to why are those people out on the road? Why are they walking? Why are they risking? what they are risking, uh, not connecting it with you know, the US uh, invasion of, and destabilization of that entire region, uh, starting with the uh, war uh, on Iraq in 2003. How can we even talk about uh, holding these people responsible for war crimes accountable? It's not part of the discourse. How do we inject that into people's consciousness, that there, that there are consequences and people that are responsible should be made to pay for those consequences? Easy question. <laughs> Pick it up. <laughs> uh, you know, it's possible that it's a cop-out, but I don't know that there is an answer to that. I don't know that there's an easy answer to that. I think a big part of why I write, why I'm a writer, is to ask questions. You know, ask as many questions as possible and, and, and provoke thought and dialogue. Um, I realize that's part of what we're doing up here, and it seems that the big picture is increasingly difficult to grasp. You know, and, and so when you talk about, you know, the destabilization of, of, of a region, it, you know, I, I think when w the dominant mode at this time seems to be moving images. And it's not always easy for a news crew, you know, sitting behind a desk to say, okay, here are these incredibly moving images of people walking. Now let's spend 20 minutes explaining to you exactly why they're doing that. No, they, they, they'd much rather focus on the immediate, the, I, I think, the, the, the power of the image. Uh, and I think the beauty of being a writer, I hope, I see how you 
guys feel about it as well, is that we have more time and we have the ability to create empathy, especially with what we write, because I don't think you can be dictated to by a page. You know, you have to, you have, to have the ability to read and you have to create it in your mind. So you have to meet the author halfway. And I, that's possibly why literature is so important and perhaps even more important at, at this time. I actually <clears throat> want to ask you, because you, are, you, work in the media, you work in the media, you, in, you are involved with the public life of words, which nevertheless have to, have to reach people on some private, visceral way. What is, what's, what's your response to the question you asked? Well, my response is having created a, a weekly, one hour, nationally, internationally syndicated radio program, giving public talks, uh, being out there and injecting the counter narrative to all the propaganda that's spewed out by the corporate control media. So that's you know, my little effort. But I, I love what you said, said about uh, writing because that Harkins echoes something that uh, Arundhati Roy, the great Indian writer and activist, uh, said that, that uh, fiction is the finest form of truth. And through, through fiction, we can understand reality. So I often tell people, if you want to understand imperialism, read Conrad's Heart of Darkness. You know, if you want to understand a megalomania and, and um, monomaniacal thinking, read Melville's Moby, Moby Dick. It's there in fiction. I'm just getting a sign that we have uh, five minutes, so we want to go to uh, audience questions in the time remaining. After five minutes, After five minutes okay. So that's that's you know what I'm trying to do is you know shake up the kasbah, but, and introducing radical ideas. But you know, we've got poetry, we've got spoken word poetry, we've got all kinds of forms of music, you know, that are pushing, pushing. You know, there have got to be multiple forms of intimate, private language, which is what I associate with um, music, poetry, um, fiction, and, and certain kinds of nonfiction, and um, galvanizing public language. Um, you know, the great orators um, are always, have always traditionally been able to um, bring the grand statements, the big ideas, you know, they've been able to give them an emotional and a linguistic charge that like hits you personally. So you're living on that vision of a public track of some grander, you know, world and self and set of possibilities and you're be, you are feeling, I can't do without it, I have to have it. Thinking about the question you posed in terms of what's happening in uh, Europe, the Middle East, um, I feel like I can't directly speak to that, not having enough information and not having been able to um, direct my attention uh, at this point in my life and my work into those issues. But it, it makes me think about just how many problems there are that we could speak to and how few of us feel like we really have the words or the power to tackle some of these big issues, especially things that may be happening on the other side of the world. And I think that part of the threat of group speak right now is that even for like the authors, the artists, the journalists, the alternative voices, um, it's all wrapped up in fame. It's all wrapped up in recognition. And I think there's this profound sense of powerlessness that if you don't have 10,000 followers on Twitter or 100,000 or a million, if you don't have X number of people liking you on Facebook, if you put out an artistic video and it only gets a couple hundred likes or views on YouTube, because it's not like a dancing cat or it's, you know, it's, it's not some kind of satirical representation of what you're doing, um, that it's, it's not valid, it's not good enough. And I think that there's a lot of people who become silenced because we don't feel like our voices matter. So I think just, you know, 
continuing to speak and to create, to make that music, to write that poetry, to put that art on the walls, to talk to each other one-on-one -on -one in cafes, in our homes, to have these conversations, to keep speaking, um, that may be enough in a time in which group speak requires your, uh, your thoughts to be tweetable or to be YouTubeable or to be, you know, on, on some scale beyond what is normal human reach and capacity. We're gonna, we have some time left now for audience comments, questions. Well, it's communities, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not the community. So that's, you know, that's the first thing. Um, but that is an absolutely huge question. It's partly, you know, a, vi the, a, a vibrant life of discussion, of, um, of, of political action, local, 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 of, of art, of culture in these communities that develops um, a contempt for this ignorant um, larger discourse and that develops um, um, tools, that develops the tools to, to counter it, um, to go against it, to make it look deadening um, and, and lifeless and punitive. I think we need to reject um, the, the narrative of the apocalypse mm. and mm. And I think we need to reject the narrative that there is a full victory, that there is somehow some full ultimate social justice equity victory that we're going to achieve in our lives or at any point in the future. And I think that to keep creating alternatives and to keep creating alternative communities um, is enough. It's important enough to fight for. It's important enough to keep doing the work that we do and to keep creating alternatives and knowing that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, those alternatives and these communities and these voices are going to keep transforming and changing. And it doesn't need to look like it did in the 60s. It doesn't need to look like it did in the 80s or the 90s. And what we're creating now is going to look different 10 years from now than, than what it is now. And that's OK. And that it can give pleasure. You know, yeah, fun with it. all these movements. Were so have been so much fun as well as scary. I mean, pleasure, it matters. The only thing I'd add to that is we're doing it right now. We're meeting in person. We're seeing each other face to face, and we're hearing each other's voices. I, I think that's the beauty of a local movement: is it already prizes that closeness, that proximity. And the beauty of what the JLF is even doing right now, it not just prioritizes that, but it brings the world here for a broader conversation. Um, I would say the same because Harvard University a while back did a study that has been sort of my mantra. And it talked about what people fear most. Death was third, dentists were second. <laughs> But the first fear that people have is the fear of being made a fool of in public. So I say act up with friends often, because once you get over that, you're OK. You're good. You're better than death. And um, you know, my acting up often is about being in cafes, turning to someone and say, hey, I want to I show you on my iPad something really cool. They look at me like, you know, because I've aged a few years since I've done this, and they don't get it. And then I'll show them something, and we talk about it. it. You know, acting up in cafes has been my favorite thing to do all over the world. So we can make a difference. People are astonished when I'm in other places that Americans actually think about something other than fashion, which I know nothing about, or football, and, um, and that we're not all warmongers. So I said, you know, spread your viewpoint as much as you can. And thank you for doing it yourselves, because you've all made a huge difference in my life, and I thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I, I'd first like to thank all of you, and particularly you, Margot, for your focus on uh, shame and guilt amongst those who represent differences. And that doesn't begin in the context of mass media. It begins within the context of the family. So my suggestion to be included amongst all the others is to invite your family members to think critically publicly and to honor what they have to say and what they have to think, even though it may not be your way or your thoughts. Thank you. Right on. <laughs> and right on. <laughs> and thank you very much for, for what you've been sharing. And I'd like to reflect back what I think I'm hearing in a synthesis. It seems to me what you're, uh, in terms of action, communication is the, is the seed of action and thought and language. So the way that we think about the th things, the way that we um, frame them, the way that we describe them, the stories we tell lead us to live our lives the way we are living them. So it's very important what the writers say, what the media says. So that's one point. The other is that what you're, the, the message in uh, synthesis I, I get is that we could transcend group speak. We can transcend identification. We can still identify with that which is rich for ourselves as individuals, as cultures, um, as neighborhoods and communi communities, and at the same time, go, move in the direction that uh, Robert Fuller, if anybody's familiar with him, um, he writes about, he came, coined the term rankism. And, I, and David, I think that goes towards what you were saying, the cause. Why are all these people walking? Why are these people risking their lives and the lives of their children, drowning? Um, and starving and, and making this journey from their home, homelands, to other countries where they're not welcome. We're not asking why, and we need to. And the re one of the basic reasons could be rankism, that there are isms of every kind that in which one group of people puts themselves in a place of separation and superiority over another people and says, they're poor, I want their resources, I'm taking their resources, their lives are secondary to our desires. And so this kind of overall rankism is, it seems to me, at the root of, of the danger of group speak the identification or misidentification, over-identification of one group over another, when we are all humanity. So, I mean, am I getting what you're saying? <laughs> you're, and you're making your own contribution, so <laughs> thank you. We're running out of time. Is there one last comment, question? Thank you. So I'll play the devil's advocate here, I'm sorry. Uh, so when you have a person or an organization against the government, how easy it is to blame the government for all the wrongs and see this person or the organization as a victim? Do we delve into where the government is coming from? And the reason I'm asking this question is because the way this floor was opened, you mentioned a lot of organizations like Greenpeace and others, and it seems as if there's mayhem in the world's largest democracy. I don't know about your case as to why you were blacklisted. I read about Greenpeace. The world's, uh, okay, this, the intelligence agency of this world's largest democracy had proof that Greenpeace was being funded by foreign organizations to stall the protests, uh, uh, to so stall a couple of projects. That was the reason the government acted. Now, Taking an objective view, should I trust Greenpeace, which is an international organization and is being portrayed as a victim, or my government, which I have elected, and that is acting on the secret agency's views? 
Well, we've actually run out of time. I'd be happy to talk to you uh, sure, uh, sure. when this concludes. I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Margo, uh, Adrian, and Ryan. Uh, thank you all for coming. And in the words of W.H. Auden,